Right, welcome to uh, week 8, topic 7, assessment in the chemical sciences. And as you're well aware, your um, results will be posted for assessment task number 1 um, on today's uh, um, Moodle, and that it will be a Monday the 28th, so please check for your results. Um, the second thing I'd like to point to is, is, you know, we probably need to be having marked assessment task number 1 more mindful of the constraints of the assessment tasks, and I'll talk to this as we go through. Um, this is a useful uh, unit, so topic 7. It's actually a, a little bit of a, a summary. Um, we covered assessment in topic 5 for the sciences. We're now specifically going back to revisit that, and it's probably some really good double loop learning here, um, given the results for assessment task number 1, because some students are going about doing their own thing and uh, not really interpreting um, the, the 5 E's approach or the E5 model in the way that it's designed to be interpreted. Now I'll talk more about that as I go through. So when we talk about primary connections in the 5 E's model, we can see this table, um, it was in last week's Zoom, so it's not new to you, but what we've got here are the five phases of the, the E5 model. The focus, and of course the assessment focus, when we look down the right hand column. And we can see that it moves from a diagnostic, through a formative, through a summative model. Now this is really critical, because in your lesson plans and in your lesson sequences, we would have been looking for a lot of questioning at the diagnostic phase. Engage students and elicit prior knowledge. Look at that, that's pretty explicit. So you have to ask yourself, were you doing that? Was that apparent? The second stage is formative assessment. This is the hands-on stage for learners. And here is where you know the teacher is, is, is doing most of their constructivist work here. This is where Vygotsky's model, you know, the most capable other, comes into its own. Um, the teacher is you know, the meddler in the middle, walking around the classroom Yet discussing concepts, helping students frame and reframe their, their, their learning schema. And we can see here, even as students begin to explain in stage three, you know, it's very much formative assessment. They're now starting to develop the language. And this whole assessment task number one was all about language, so it's really important that we understand how the 5 E's model addresses this. Then we get to the elaborate stage and the evaluate stage, where we're moving very much into the students demonstrating context and knowledge. Now, it's a really important thing to note here, this box here on the right-hand side, the light grey one, the fourth one, uh, going down that particular column. Summative assessment of the science inquiry skills is critical. Very few students in assessment task number one actually included the science inquiry skills in their location, in, in, in locating the topic in their investigation, or when they start to link to their science understandings. It was all about the content knowledge, it wasn't about the inquiry skills. And there was really a minority of students who actually did this, who actually identified science inquiry skills as an area for investigation alongside science understandings. And so therefore, you can't expect to achieve on, on one of the E's if you're not doing that. Okay, if you're not ex explicating um, from the ACS framework the science inquiry skills relevant to your suggestion or to your um, lesson sequence, then you can't be given credit for those marks. You need to understand that, please. That was a major oversight from quite a few submissions. The evaluate stage, again, summative assessment of the science understanding. So most of you just jumped straight from here to explain, straight into evaluate. There was very little acknowledgement of the science inquiry skills. And again, that is a little bit of a faux pas, that in terms of assessment and in terms of teaching this particular context. So when we talk about the types of assessment, let's rehash to week five. We've got diagnostic, formative, and summative. But they can be flexible and visual, and that's really what I'm going to touch on today, that they don't have to be one particular type of assessment. So our diagnostic, for instance, doesn't have to be closed. It can be quite an open process. The questions can be open-ended, and they can be fat. Too often, we were using skinny questions in assessment task number one, closed questions, where we were trying to define right versus wrong answer. Again. Um, these questions can be done differently. They can be elaborated, they can be open, and they can be uh, um, decontextualized so that students can actually then go about explaining their knowledge framework um, without you, first of all, testing and, and, and trying to identify where, where their framework deviates or goes wrong. So it's, it's really important um, you know, to, to, to work with the whole student, and I'll talk more about that in, in upcoming uh, lectures. But you know, we, we can't strip the student down to the no knowledge of a science paradigm we really must work with what the student has, with the holistic student, and with the whole framework they've got. Formative assessment can also be quite colourful, can also be quite tactile. 
and we can see here from this little example that it doesn't just have to be about language and talking, it can be about model building, it can be about constructivism. And summative, of course, is an actual application where students are actually building their own models and their models can stand up to so some actual testing. So it doesn't need to be um, some of those, you know, points that Dennis Goodrum makes in, in his presentation. They don't need to be written, boring, multiple choice tests. They can actually be demonstrations. And these are some of the things I want you to think about going into assessment task number two, where you're actually required to make recommendations for existing units of study as to how you would improve them. So when we're looking at this week's topic, we're talking about assessment four, um, for learning as a starting point. And again, the definition, it's gathering information about a gap between where the student is and where the student needs to be. And it's predicated on four basic principles. That students learn best when they understand what they're trying to learn, what's expected of them. A given feedback about the quality of their work, it's continuous. A given advice on how to make improvements, also continuous. And are fully involved in deciding what needs to be done next and who can help if needed. And this little example. A really nice uh, example of, of how that process can deliver you know, results and outcomes for learners. A very non-specific, non-elaborated drawing of a light bulb. It's not inaccurate, but nor is it entirely accurate. Now through working and through inquiry and through engagement with uh, knowledge and content, a second drawing after an investigation task. And we can see it's much more uh, scientific. The scientific literacy is, is deeper, it's more accurate, it's more specific. We can see that you know this, this mental model is an elaboration of this original mental construct. And we can see, therefore, that there's been learning. And we can actually assess what learning's taken place. Assessment of learning is the second way of looking at it and looking at assessment. Because remember, assessment drives learning. Okay, we can assess for learning, we can assess of learning. Gathering and working with evidence to enable teachers in the wider assessment community to evaluate students' progress. Okay, so we're actually enabling an evaluation of progress. So this is about judgments, about the extent and quality of student learning and what it needs to be. And so what we need here is sound criteria negotiated with and known to students. And it's also got to be reliable and accurate. So in assessment task number two, when you're looking at assessment of learning, and this will be going on throughout the formative stages of the 5E's model, make sure that you're, you know, you're ticking these boxes because some of the recommendations you may be to modify assessment, okay, and to come up with, for instance, a rubric, which gives sound criteria that is known to the students. It can also be reliable and accurate that your rubric needs to stand up to testing. Now, and again, a couple of examples here of assessment of learning. Using stickets, very constructivist you know, an ongoing graph, and you see the, the access to the mathematic models in, in terms of demonstrating outcomes, the scientific literacy is at work here. And again, we can start to see some, you know, some real uh, connections between scientific theories and, and social components through, through you know, growing literacy frameworks. So we can actually test this now. We can see the occupations that use water, and we can look at the testability of that, and we can actually look at the conceptual and, and, and con uh, concept construction of that. And the third branch we look at this week is assessment as learning. Now, we can reflect on the evidence of learning and the processes of learning. Okay, and this can be done by students, and it can also be done by teachers. And I'm going to show you a few videos in a minute as we go through, again, based on the Science by Doing material, um, where teachers are constantly reflecting on their own teaching. Okay, and we're reflecting on our teaching from a learner's perspective, and this is why we gather data. This is how assessment drives teaching. Okay, and it also drives learning. We gather data, that data is important to us, and it then creates the double learning s uh, loop where we're actually able to feed that data into our own teaching practices, and as a result, we come up with a much better um, teaching and learning framework for our students, a much better model. So assessment as learning is where we reflect on evidence of learning and the processes of learning. So we're looking at students' results. We're looking at the formative feedback. We're looking at some of our lead-in lessons and the second video I'll show you today um, from a woman called Kim, whom you haven't met before, where she talks about, you know, she actually finished up doing some, some really interesting summative assessment um, based on her previous teaching without knowing it using a concept map. So, yeah, we can talk about this continuous loop of continuous assessment. And what do we do when we assess as learning? We're reflecting on the learning process and how it helps students to focus on what they've learned, how they've learned it, and more importantly, that third box. What processes help them to learn? So, you know, the little tick box scenario, I need help with this. I can do this by myself. 
and I can help others with this. So we can see the social competency model growing here. So a summary of the assessment types. Let's reverse this. We'll tip the pyramid. We know there's three basic assessment types. We've talked about them before. They've been in your readings. They've been in your textbooks. Formative assessments informs the teacher and the learner. Diagnostic tells us where students are at. The reason we do these is for feedback for improvement. We're constantly looking to improve learning. Summative assessment gives us a measure at the end. It's our yardstick. We're able to make judgments. Again, I go back to assessment task number one. Very few students actually pointed to the, the learning standards and standards of achievement, which are embedded in the ACS curriculum. When you're assessing a unit and reporting, the first thing you do is you go to those standards. And the standards actually have a grade A to E. And when you know most competencies in the science, the ACS framework, uh, occur around that C grade. So you need to know what a C grade looks like. So when you're reporting, these are the behaviours that you're trying to identify. Again, there was a minimum of students who bothered to look at the standards. If you don't incorporate the standards, you can't be acknowledged for having completed that part of the assessment. So we use summative assessment at the end of our units. It's a grade or a mark, and it enables us to see where students are placed in the cohort, and also to quantify their level of understanding. Self-reflection. We use assessment to further our own learning. Okay which is the third type, and this is called assessment as learning, or to learn can be problem solving and lifelong learning. I don't like the term lifelong learning. It seems like we've all done something wrong. We've been sentenced to, you know, to, to a, a prison cell or, or custodial sentence for learning, um, but it is lifelong learning. It does touch into the work of David Bowd, um, who was an occupational educator, and, and, and it, it talks about the notion that we're on an ongoing cycle. A more recent version of this is George Siemens in 2005, who talked about connectivism. Um, his model is probably much more relevant than David Bowd's now. Bowd published in the late 90s, Siemens in the uh, 2000s, right up to current. He's currently still publishing. And he's more relevant because he includes a lot of information on technology. So when we come to the top of the table now, a summary of assessment purposes. Teacher and student, it's a didactic process. Assessment travels between both parties and then reporting takes the results of that to the public, to the education public, which in most cases is the parents, in some cases can be NAPLAN, in some cases it can be curriculum bodies and, and, and um, uh, you know, s regional offices. The publics to which this, this, this reporting takes place um, are many and varied. But we've got three types of assessment, diagnostic, formative, summative. The teacher uses diagnostic to plan, and we, you know, we know this. This is just repeating stuff we know. The formative assessment, again, also aids our planning. Okay, I tried this today, it didn't go very well. Okay, I'm gonna have to look at that part of my unit, my pre-teaching, and make sure I get that right next time. Formative is also really good for students to give feedback. You know, oh, miss, I really enjoy this task. You know, this, I really, really like this, this, this computer game, you know? All of these different things that you get feedback on. And the summative, of course, the teacher reports to the many publics, and the students, of course, get their formal feedback. So we can see in this assessment you know, dialogue on this dance between teachers, students, between teachers and learners, and between you know, the interest groups or the stakeholders in learning, it's an ongoing and constant dance. And we need to have verifiable processes that are robust and transparent to enable us to observe these. In assessment task number one, we asked you to look at those, and some of the standards and the levels of achievement were an important part of that verifiability. What learning behaviours are we looking for? A little video from Dennis Goodrum. Let's have a look at it again. It will remind you a little bit about MAT as a teacher and diagnostic assessment, what it's all about. Good little video. MAT is exploring a technique for diagnostic assessment. He hopes that this technique will help him to answer the questions. Where are my students starting from? How can I take this into account when planning this unit of work? I find that diagnostic assessment is very useful when planning lessons. In the past when I first started teaching I didn't use it as much and what I was finding was that I'd assume kids had prior knowledge on a topic and they didn't. So I would have gone ahead and already planned a sequence of lessons and then had to go back because the kids didn't understand some of the things that I thought they would already know coming into the lesson. That's a really, really good example, isn't it? 
using diagnostic tools in order to empower the teacher and the learner to work more effectively within that constructivist space. Okay, to be a more capable, more capable other. And that's what diagnostic smells like, and that's what diagnostic does. Formative assessment. Let's have a look at what Dennis Goodrum says about formative assessment. And he'll introduce to you a teacher called Kim, um, who was doing a concept map actually, you know, really to, to look at setting up her second unit of study, only to discover gaps in her teaching of the first unit. So it's a really interesting reflecting reflection on her part, and also a good example of formative assessment and how teachers can get valuable feedback too. Questions. How are the students progressing as the unit of work unfolds? Where do they need constructive feedback, additional support or challenge? Where does the unit of work need to be modified on the fly to best address student needs? I'm actually about to start a, a new bit of a section of ecology and I want to actually know what the students know already about the topic. I don't actually want to spend too long on material that they already know, that they've had exposure to. So in order to um, do a bit of a pre-test, I'm going to use a concept map uh, for that purpose, diagnostically. And then I'll come back to um, the students and do another concept map down the track so I can see the progression uh, between their understanding of concepts now and later and uh, hopefully my teaching methodology will enable any gaps to be plugged that I am aware of when I have a look at those first uh, concept maps. So I'm going to start up a concept map on the board here just to interrelate these factors that we came up with yesterday and then we're going to move on to a concept map using some more words and develop the ideas further. Kim uses some concepts with which students are already familiar to model how to construct a concept map. That population has needs, and those needs are abiotic factors. The link between population and abiotic factor, okay, I'm going to draw an arrow like that, and I'm just going to put needs, right? Population needs abiotic factors. We've named some abiotic factors there. So we've got, for example, examples of abiotic factors, oxygen, might be an example. So I'm just going to put aerobic respiration here. So I'm making the links between the words, one idea or one concept and another. I'm putting a line and on that line or on that arrow I'm putting the link. Right? So then I'm building up a concept map. We're actually moving to extend our concept map into relationships between the abiotic factors and the biotic factors in the environment. And I need to know how much you know about biotic factors so that I can plan the next few lessons. All right? Some of you might know quite a lot from primary school and from year eight. Some of you might not know all of the ideas yet, so I want to just get a picture of that so that I know how to plan. Competition relates to predation, doesn't it? Because competition would be in the food chain other than the food web, because competition is basically there's one food source and two people want it. Yeah, but so then but wouldn't competition be, a pred predation come under competition? We said that biotic is to do with living, all right, but we're not talking about you know, living, non-living, dead anymore. We're talking about living and non-living. Yeah. So non-living factors rather than dead factors. Okay. All right, so Although unintended, this exercise resulted in good formative assessment of the previous work done on abiotic factors. Um, what does abiotic mean? Abiotic are physical features. So we've got things like temperature, nutrients, oxygen, currents. It's physical factors that affect a living thing in its habitat. Uh, I wanted to use this diagnostically. I think that the students weren't as far on in their understanding as I actually thought they were. And what is bio? That's where we've got relationships between living things. So, for example, the relationship between a parrot and the food that it eats. For example, in the morning, you know, I see this whole group of flock of parrots come down for the olives that grow on the olive tree near me, and that's a relationship between the biotic components oh, like the of the environment. Yeah. Okay. All right. I was a bit nonplus when they actually didn't know the difference between abiotic and biotic factors, which is something that we have gone over very quickly. For me, that's an insight into the fact that I haven't probably taught that topic uh, or that lead up very well, and I need to remediate that.
See the CD-ROM for further... Now, Dennis is right. See the CD-ROM. Um, these are the resources I've connected you to with, and hopefully you've enrolled in the Science by Doing program online. You will have access to this material to go through and browse yourself. But how often do we hear a teacher saying to ourselves, I thought I taught that. I thought they got that. I mean, here I am starting at C, and the students are still really unclear about A and B. So this is the role of formative assessment. And here we have a very experienced teacher. And the technique she used, of course, was a concept map. So a recommendation that you may want to include when you're looking at the primary science units, primary connections units, um, and primary science units in assessment task number two you may want to look at including a concept map just by way of formative assessment if there's no inbuilt formative assessment or if you want to do more continuous formative assessment because concept maps actually serve as diagnostic, formative and summative. Now to look at summative assessment we're going to do meet a teacher called Ian. Now we, we haven't seen Ian, if those of you who have watched the online videos will have met Ian and he's an older science teacher and he's been charged with the responsibility of adopting a new summative assessment tool. Now he's in love with his old fashioned tests but his new science quarter is not. So what we're seeing here is a recommendation in action. Ian has been told to change his practice and he needs to adopt the practice of the rest of the teaching team. Things never stops. I've been teaching this adaptations unit for years and my end of topic test sorts the wheat out from the chaff. But this year I've got no choice. All the year sevens are going to have the same assessment at the end of the topic. I have to get the kids to create this mini poster and use this newfangled rubric to mark it. I'm not convinced it's going to tell me what I need to know. What do I put in my mark book? All right, eyes to me. Don't start reading the paper until I've explained it to you. All right. You may notice Everyone on the board two sheets of paper who's got the tension. Wouldn't be one Professor Goodrum, would it? for a mini poster. This one, which doesn't have much writing on it. The other one is a table. Now this table is called a rubric. The top of the table you'll see what you need to do and there are five rows on the table five rows on the table and I'll be giving you a score for each row now I don't have a lot of time to spend hunting around for the information you have to include so make sure that the labels on your drawing are obvious things don't jump out at me then I'm not wasting my time looking for them Okay, we've been working on adaptations for two weeks now, haven't we, Amelia? Two weeks. So by now you should know all you need to know on this topic. You've got two lessons to do this. Get started. Ugh, got a pile of these things to get through. Now Jacob's creature. Looks like a bit of a mix between what a turtle and a duck. I don't know what this one's supposed to be. <laughs> okay, now for the acid test for this rubric. How well are these blasted criteria going to go with real student work? Okay. First up, Jacob's drawing. Well, he has included a drawing and it's drawn clearly. It doesn't have a lot of extra guff in the way, so I'll give that a score of three. Next, two physical adaptations. Well, looks like he's only labelled two adaptations in total. Both are physical adaptations, so it's at least a score of two if he's got them right. He's pointed out the webbed feet, but he hasn't told me why they're useful. Hmm. Looks like he's fallen short on the spines too. He's pointed out they're sharp, but not told me why that's useful. So, okay, so it's a score of two. Well, I'm reluctant to admit this, but I think the scoring worked quite well. The kids' work showed if they'd really got the idea of adaptations or not. Most of them came up with imaginative creatures with appropriate adaptations though some of them 
didn't spell out how the features are useful. So I guess looking over the class as a whole, I think I need to emphasise the difference between physical and behavioural adaptations a bit more. What an interesting result. An experienced science teacher, by changing his assessment techniques, adopting a rubric, making explicit to the learners, has actually been able to reflect on his own teaching. Again, a recommendation from uh, you know, the, the, the head of school or head of department um, who suggested he implement a new assessment regime. It wasn't entirely popular, but in terms of teacher outcomes and learner outcomes, it was probably a better result. So when we talk about assessment and assessment purposes, there's a range of ways that you can look at assessment, and particularly around the chemical sciences. This little summary here is a range again taken from the science by doing resources. I mean they do it so well and the reason why I put this up is because it's there 24-7 for you. You don't need to remember what's said. You can actually go straight to the source and you can review this for yourself. So if you go onto science by doing into the professional modules and in the professional modules you'll find one on assessment and in the assessment module you'll find all of this material and all of these videos. My aim is to summarize it for you. So when we look at the, the you know, the mix of di diagnostic, formative and assessment strategies you can use, here's a really, really good table to demonstrate how they can be mixed up. Interviews, we can see, a diagnostic and formative. Concept maps, diagnostic, formative and summative. Notebooking, diagnostic and formative. Portfolios, and we'll go through and look at some of these briefly, but I'm not going to spend a lot of air time on this because, primarily, it's here for you 24-7. Peer review is a really interesting one, formative get students to work in pairs and teams. And again, primary connections as a model, as the E5 or 5E's learning model, does this a lot. When you're doing science investigations at stages two and three, it's all in a peer-based situation, okay? Or if not peer-based investigations, uh, a, a lone investigation, but the results are always shared and discussed. Self-assessment is also formative, getting students to self-assess. It's got a huge role. Students report. Doing a report, again, is very formative. It helps you understand exactly what they have gained from the, le the lesson and the sequence and what they haven't. And rubrics, of course, are formative in helping orient the learner and also summative in helping you to report and quantify the, the success of that orientation. So let's go through and have a look at some of these step by step. Interviews, again, it's taken from the science by doing um, CD-ROM, Exploring and Practicing Assessment Techniques. And if you get on there, it's actually interactive. It allows you to mess around with some of these and get your hands dirty. So interviews can be used for diagnostic and formative reasons. Students usually work in small groups. The teacher circulates the room. The meddler in the middle interacts with each group. The student conversation is focused on a picture or a graph, so we've got some sort of common focus, a stimuli. The teacher uses then questioning. Again, here we've got assessment task number one. For example, probing, paraphrasing, prompting, defining, fat questions, thin questions, constantly working to expose the student's uh, learning schema and understanding. And interviews are best used to identify preconceived ideas or misconceptions. So it would have been a very good technique for assessment task number one. Notebooking, okay, a really, you know, science by doing folk and the ACS in general lends itself very well to notebooking. Why? Because it, you know, it's very good diagnostic. You can look at the students' notes once they've looked at something themselves, and you can look at their notes later once they've done some formative assessment. And of course, this can easily be then converted into a summative assessment task, whether it's the old pen and paper tests, or whether, based on their notions and their learning, they can actually get into model construction or into something with ICTs and, and blogging, etc., etc. Science notebooks, a record of student thinking and classroom experiences. It's what scientists do, so it often replicates authentic situations. It's also good for developing data, in other words, inquiry skills. How else are you going to document their inquiry skills and their knowledge of graphs, the purpose of graphs, their scientific literacy, if you're not using a notebook? So it's really important to do that. The purpose, they help students develop, practice and refine science understandings. They also provide a place where language, data and experience come together, where students are making meaning. And that's, you know, that's really inf important formative assessment. Rubrics. We saw Ian struggle with the notion of the newfangled rubric. But it, it's just a list of criteria for a piece of work. And that list of criteria is scaffolded 
um, according to you know, levels of performance. Now those levels of performances don't get made up in a vacuum. They come from the ACS itself and they come from the standards of, of performance or standards of achievement. They're embedded in student year level achievement statements. So again, assessment task number one. Very few of you bothered to look at those. Very few of you bothered to include them. Very few of you bothered to identify what a learning behaviour looks like when it's competent. That's a huge oversight. Okay, so clearly some of your summative assessment um, was not going to work. Okay, it certainly wasn't explicated in the way that it needed to be. A rubric is great because it clearly sets out what counts for students in assessment. It helps them identify it and it helps them to plan for it um, and it provides them direction in how to complete a task. So for a teacher, you know, you can collate data from, from the application of a rubric really simple in a, in a very simple sequential way and it also allows you to identify the strengths and the weaknesses of individuals and how that maps onto the strengths and weaknesses of your whole class. And when you look at that, that gives you a really good, you know, really detailed feedback on, on where the strengths and weakness of your teaching is and what you may need to, to do to beef your teaching up. Self-assessment, you know, we note it as formative, but it can also be used as summative. And students standing back and making an objective assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of their own work. It can also be used for peers as well. And it can be done you know, also integrated with a rubric, which is a fabulous way to do it. Um, and it becomes summative when it's integrated with the rubric. You know, peer assessment, um, everybody does an assessment, you submit four assessments, and then you self-reflect. And you summarise those four assessments, and you assess your own work and submit that to the teacher. The teacher then may conference or interview you to discuss the findings. But essentially, look at the learning that's taken place there. You've had, you know, a 360 degree feedback on your assessment. Now, from your own perspective as self and also from your peers through peer assessment. The teacher then takes the, you know, the sage on the stage model and sits down with you and becomes the guide on the side and steps you through that assessment and helps you identify behaviours that you may need to adopt to strengthen your performance. So again, some really, really good strategies for and recommendations for improving assessment in assessment task number two that you may want to look at. A student report, again, formative and summative, and we probably understand that one quite well. You can do it as a final summative you know, to get a grade, or you can do it to reflect on your progressive and developing understanding. Portfolios, one of my favourites. Yeah, I really do like portfolio assessment because it grows over time. Students do have bad days. Students have bad lessons. Students have bad weeks. A portfolio helps even out those factors. It also gives you a developmental view where you can actually see what's going on for a student in their learning. It also enables you to develop a broad range of tasks, numeracy, literacy, so you're assessing the whole student rather than just you know, the scientific schema that student is able to access and use. So again, think closely about portfolios. They're an effective means of assessing real or authentic tasks. Y you can design and conduct experiments and you know, conduct, create and design your own, own assessment of those experiments. And, and more importantly, they're done longitudinally. They, they reflect growth and learning over time. So again, it can be done quite as a good review um, to, to developing a science understanding. Concept maps, we've seen uh, Kim in her discussion of diagnostic and formative applications, it can also be done summatively. You can assign a grade to a student's final concept map. You can do incorporate ICTs into concept maps too. There's some great um, concept mapping software as well which you can include. And again, the purpose, how well students understand and make sense of connections okay, between concepts that have been taught, they've had to build the relationship. So it's you know, quite a mature form of assessment um, and yet can work very, very well diagnostically, formatively and summatively. It tells you where the relationships are breaking down and ultimately it tells you what happens in your teaching to help cement those relationships. Peer review, formative. I actually believe peer review can be used um, formatively and combined with other strategies such as self-assessment and teacher review to become a summative technique. So have a close look at these. These are some of the recommendations that you may elect to make when you're looking at your two primary science units in assessment task number two. Let's put task one behind us and move on and start learning from some of that. But please, you need to be much more in touch with the ACS curricula, with the standards, outcomes and achievement statements, so that you can actually you know, translate your assessment into reporting. Other recommendations you may want to consider for assessment in task number two. When you're looking at your science units, you may think this is an absolutely complete unit. 
But wait a minute, it's a little bit silent in some areas. It's not that inclusive. It doesn't actually differentiate the lunar mo modalities. So you may want to look at, you know, at the VARC model, visual, auditory, um, kinesthetic, okay? Um, you may want to look at the different types of learning, and you may want to beef up the unit in some of those areas. Or you may want to take an indigenous perspective. How does this mainstream science connect, or how is it explained using an indigenous perspective and do some parallel teaching? It's a good recommendation to consider for some of the, the um, primary connections models, which, you know, actually are quite cultural... Um, culturally centric. Um, so it's really important to think more broadly in a cultural sense. You may also want to integrate and explore using more ICTs. In other words, you might want to include ICs in your teaching. You may also want to look at some ICTs in the learning when you're looking at some of these particular hands-on primary connections units. Um, one of the recommendations you can easily make is to include more ICTs. In fact, some of the, you know, one of the worst performed criteria in, in assessment task number one was your adaption and integration of ICTs. When you look at the criteria, it was clearly explicit that you had to look at how you would include in your lesson sequence ICTs. Um, this was quite poorly done ac across the, the cohort of, of responses. And the third group of recommendations you may want to use is, is to broaden or mix the inquiry processes. So you may want to move between the five E's and a problem-based uh, situation where you're using authentic and situated um, uh, science to explore and, and, and teach science understandings and develop inquiry skills. And also, if you're looking at robotics or you're looking at environmental issues or, or ethical dilemmas, you may also look at the, the human aspect, okay, and the human endeavor aspect of science by, by applying an ethical dimension to, to your inquiries. POE, you may look at a particular investigation and step outside the, you know, within the, the 5 E's framework and, and apply a POE model. Jigsawing, again, expert groups, share and disseminate, learning circles, you can join groups together, you can chain them together to, to develop concepts and relationships and then you can break them up, okay, then to, to, to mix them with other concepts and relationships to develop and broaden understandings. It's a little bit like a human concept map. Learning stations, very tactile and often supported by wonder walls. Okay, when you went round these stations, what happened? What did you feel? Okay, and your wonder wall, you can build a wonder wall for each station or for all stations if you like. Emissaries are a form of jigsawing, where we send you know a member from from each group or each small country or each small, you know, if you're doing a role play situation, from each group of, of people or scientists or, or f stakeholders. You send them to a meeting, and at that meeting, that they swap perspectives. They then come back from that meeting, and they go back to their home group, and they report those perspectives. And then the group can actually work on producing a report, a complex, a presentation, anything that can come from that, any sort of outcome, final outcome that you wish to measure. So when we talk about assessment task number two, I want you to start getting a little bit excited, if you can, about how you may be able to change or develop some of these primary connections modules. Now, they don't have to be huge recommendations, but you are required to make two recommendations for each science, primary connections science module that you look at. Okay, it's, and that is the requirement of this assessment task. That must come out. Two recommendations. Here are some areas where you could think about integrating some of those recommendations over and above you know, manipulating or, or improving or developing the assessment strategies embedded within each of those primary connections units. The final slide for this week um, that I want to take you to is uh, an introduction to our forum task. Now, forums are not being terribly widely used, um, entirely up to you, um, but what I'm trying to do here is put in, in place a situation where you can actually get on with a group of your peers. Um, I will put up the primary connections units uh, modules in the forum. Uh, I will load them up as documents. You'll be able to access them, and the task here is with a group of your peers is to analyze one curriculum unit in detail. Now you can do this together, okay? You can absolutely do this together because by doing this, you're actually setting yourself up to complete assessment task number two. The first step is to identify and summarize the science understanding at the front of the unit. Now the primary connections units are all done as PDF files. You can simply jump into them. You can get to them via Scootle or directly via the primary connections website. And you can see the science understanding is emblazoned at the front of the unit. Okay, that's pretty explicit for you. The explore and explain 5E's phase okay, is going to be a little more complex because you're going to have to look at stages 2 and 3, the inquiry skills. So for that, I'm suggesting why don't you 
and, and you'll find you know the, the explore and explain stages uh, in the unit summary which is usually an, within the appendices three tasks for you see if you can in, um, in get into the, the, the unit overview and, and have a look at how that unit develops scientific explanations for observation in other words what are the learning activities that it's creating and what is the hands-on experience that underpins those learning activities so what does the unit want students to do and therefore what's it suggesting they need to learn you will also find something about that in the outcome statements have a look at the questioning focuses and practices how do these develop scientific explanations and conceptual understandings within the learners so you'll find the questioning embedded in each of the units too in each of the lesson sequences how are these trying to develop scientific explanations and conceptual understandings and finally have a look at the collaborative learning activities because these are the three features of the uh, primary connections model it's a five E's model it contains you know, scientific understandings based in learning activities questioning to drive those activities and, and help the formative assessment and collaborative learning groups um, usually in teams and pairs um, to help you know the teacher work with those formative um, ideas for the elaborate and evaluate stages please that the final two stages of the model um, identify and summarize the following in the unit overview again it's the same document in the appendices how the unit extends understanding to a new concept or makes connections to additional concepts through the investigations so how is it doing this extending understanding to new contexts or to new connections and how do students get to re-represent their understandings and reflect on their learning journey so what kind of student you know, loop back is there in the unit what sort of student feedback um, and how can teachers collect evidence about those that that feedback so here we're looking you know if you're looking for areas where you would make a recommendation I'm trying to point here to five aspects of the the unit overviews where you may want to look and test to see whether they can actually be improved modified or made more explicit for a certain group of users you may use the qualifier here to say look I want to adapt this unit for indigenous students and you may therefore beef up the literacy component and you may also brief up the cultural components of that unit assessment task number two gives you a lot of creativity it gives you the opportunity to be very creative and very interpretive in your work follow these four steps as a group identify the science understandings follow the, the 5e's model okay and have a look for the explanations scientific explanations the questioning and the collaborative learning activities in there you'll find information about formative assessment from the final two stages okay the elaborate and evaluate phases have a look at how this it moves from formative assessment in these three dot points through to summative assessment in these two dot points and then finally report back to each other share and discuss what you find this will be the basis for a more you know, cohesive and more detailed more thorough coverage of assessment task two than we saw for assessment task number one many students you know, had strong parts in task number one and they had quite significant gaps in your analysis for this assessment task try to get over all parts of the task try to explore the scientific explanations the questioning and focus questions and practices have a look at the collaborative learning activities and how these three come together to create formative assessment processes then have a look at summative assessment okay how new understandings are connected how they connect to previous teaching how they connect to student hands-on activities up here in the formative and how a teacher is going to capture this and report on it all right thank you